Thank you all for joining today's discussion hosted by New York Society for Construction Solutions. Today we have an amazing panel to discuss modular prefab and offsite construction. And it presents an amazing opportunity to learn more about industrialized construction. Um, we've brought together experts really with experience around the globe. Uh, and so today's group really does strive beyond our typical New York City discussion. So thank you to the panelists for joining and for, um, for your time and opinions and for what should be an amazing learning opportunity. Uh, before we get started, just to run through the agenda, I'm going to start off just a quick intro to the SDS and who we are. Uh, and then we're really going to jump right into the panel. Um, a little housekeeping. Up in the top right corner, you can switch between an active speaker or seeing everyone. Uh, we do kind of have the liberty of seeing everyone, not just the speakers, but everyone on the call, which we feel brings everyone together for more of a, an open discussion. Um, today, as well, we're allowing our presenters to show pictures and resources with their discussion. Hopefully, that presents more of a discussion as well as a learning opportunity for everyone. Before I do kick off, I'm going to do a quick intro survey. And this just helps us get a better feel for who's here so we can tailor our discussion towards that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Everyone's going to get a survey that's going to come around really quickly here. And if everyone could just fill that out, that would be super helpful for us. And I'll share the results. Three quick questions. One, do you work in New York City? Number two, what's your field of occupation? Number three, is this your first SDS event, Society for Construction Solutions? And as people are filling this out, I'll just read out some of the results here. But uh, about 70 people. 70% are not working in New York City, so thank you all for joining around the U.S. And if it's anything like past meetings, join it from around the world. Um, in terms of the breakdown, we've got 38% of people working construction, followed by 17% in architecture, 12% in engineering, 13% manufacturing. And then we've got about a 65-35 split on if you, this is your first SES event. So for folks that are new, thank you so much for joining, and we look forward to having you in future meetings as well. I'm going to reshare my screen. Just a little bit about the SCS before we do get into the exciting panel, and I'll go very quickly here, but we're a group that is a global network. We have chapters around the world in major cities. And really, it's a group of people across the AEC industry. And it's a wide range of people from architects, engineers, construction, investors, software, research, students, manufacturing, consultants, all that come together to discuss innovation and technology around construction and how construction can continue to evolve into where it is today and where it's going in the next few years. Um, we have meetings typically once a month, typically in person, typically 50 to 60 people. Um, as we see via these meetings and due to today's environment, uh, it's provided us a good opportunity to have a lot more people attend and have a, a much bigger footprint. Um, but typically, we would come in, we would meet with each other, uh, network a little bit around the room, and then there's two or three uh, featured presenters that present something that's interesting or groundbreak in the industry. Um, and we've, we've gone a, a wide variety of topics over the past few years. With that, really, I, I'm just going to hand it off over to Hugh Seaton. Hugh is general manager with Adept XR Learning, and he's also um, on the panel for SDS. And he's done a lot of work to get this panel together. So without further ado, I'll, I'm going to kick it off to him to intro the rest of the panel. Thanks, Blake. Um, so yeah, we're super excited to have this group. Um, well, uh, Ray Boff from DPR, Stacy Scopano from uh, Skender, Paul Doherty from the Digit Group, and we're going to start off with Chuck. Um, each of our panelists will speak for 
uh, about five minutes. We're not going to be too strict about that. And then we'll go into kind of a general discussion. So along the way, feel free to type in some questions in the chat and we'll get to them as each of the, as we kind of round out the, the initial uh, introductions. So with that, over to you, Chuck. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chuck Savage, and I am the Director of Modular Building Design and Construction for a company by the name of JC Elite Construction Services in New York City. Uh, we are a turnkey modular general contractor who builds projects not only for our developer clients, but we also do our own developments using modular construction. Uh, we are also a modular manufacturer doing work overseas uh, for industrialized housing. Uh, just to give you a quick background on my personal background, I've been one of the older person now in the modular industry. I've been doing this for 42 years from both the manufacturer's side, uh, building with both steel frame and wood frame construction. And I've also worked on the general construction side, providing the non-modular portions of a development project, uh, primarily in the greater New York metropolitan region, but I've gone into other parts of the Northeast. Uh, in my 42 years, I've built over 5 million square feet of modular projects ranging from multifamily housing, hotels, student dormitories, military housing, educational facilities, and correctional facilities. Um, over that 42 years, I've experienced firsthand what works and what doesn't work uh, within the modular industry, and I'm hoping to share some of that experience today. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Keys to consider. Know why you want to utilize modular. And it's something I always ask my clients when I first meet with them. And I'm, I can't tell you how many people will say, well, I want to save money. I don't think anybody on this panel today is going to tell you a broad scenario. You're going to always save money with modular construction. Sometimes you might based on your geographical region. Sometimes it's going to be just the same as conventional and other times it's going to be actually more. So you, if you're just going in there thinking that modular is always going to be a method of saving money, you've got to rethink that. If you come back and you say to, to say to us here on the panel, maybe you want to reduce your schedule. That's a great thought process where you're meeting a scheduled deadline. If you happen to be a, a uh, student housing developer and you have to meet your end of July, beginning of August opening for school, that's another reason. You want to minimize weather delays. You might be in a part of the country or the world where, uh, you know, you just have severe weather or just a short construction uh, envelope to work in. Uh, maybe you're looking to reduce your construction administration costs because of the reduced schedule or some of your interest carrying costs. But one of the things that I I try to push with people is that, especially when you're really astute developers, you're going to generate revenue faster. And that's very important when it comes to either a hotel, multifamily apartments, whatever. It's very important that that's, that's a, a good philosophy to look for, not just think I'm going to save money. I always talk about modular construction as a systems approach to construction. Now, there's a lot of systems within the construction industry, block and plank, and uh, all different types of construction systems. Uh, and what modular is, is just another potential systems approach. And we try to explain to the developers and to the architects and engineers to try to work within that system. Uh, our industry as a whole has probably shot itself in the foot too many times by trying to please everybody. And we're not the answer for every particular solution. What works best is to understand the parameters of modular construction, work with that, when you have to integrate conventional construction into the modular process to make it successful, uh, and just also understanding your own surroundings. There are places in this country that you just can't ship a modular, a six-sided biometric box down the road to get to your site. So you have to understand that, and it's really just working within the parameters. Uh, and by working in the parameters, it doesn't mean that we're going to take away the creativity of an architect, about the aesthetics. It's just understanding what those parameters are so that you can have a successful project. The, the last thing and probably the most important that you have to, as a developer, commit early to this approach. 
I cannot tell you how many times that I've run into projects where it spent money, a lot of money, developing it for conventional and then find out that it was either too expensive or it just didn't fit the bill or it's not going to meet their schedule. I, they come to us as an afterthought. What you want to do is you want to take the time to do your homework, decide that modular is the answer. Now you want to then bring in all the players at the same time to work with you as a team. That's the modular manufacturer, the design team, the general contractor, and the owner or end user from day one. Don't have everybody going out and doing little separate things without having the whole team there. By doing that in the beginning, you design it once and it's going to be a success from the start. Um, you can switch the slide here. The slide says how to maximize efficiencies and avoid pitfalls of modular construction. I'm going to talk for everybody on the panel just real quickly. I don't think anybody's going to tell you that it's, you're going to run it. You're going to have a pitfall because you use modular construction. Really, it's just to understand what it is to build with modular construction to avoid pitfalls. As a, as a developer myself, we learned the hard way of what works and what doesn't work. Meaning sometimes we've tried to have the factory do too much. And what we should have done from day one is to use conventional construction for parts of the project. So you have to know when to integrate. You want to have that knowledgeable team. When I say knowledgeable team, you want to have, if you can, have, if you can uh, find it, a design team that has worked in modular, specifically have a general contractor that has done modular work. You don't want them learning on your, on your project. You need to also take the time to understand your project site and any local regulatory requirements. Um, I've had situations where somebody had asked only one question, what's the biggest modular section you can ship over the road? Well, that's not the question to ask. The question to ask is what's the biggest modular section that you can deliver to the project site and erect it in place? And they've only gone by that one little piece of information. They go off on a tangent and design something that's not going to work. So you have to know your regulatory agencies. New York is different from Boston. Boston is different than Los Angeles or Philadelphia. And everyone has their own, their own different idiosyncrasies to work with. You have to understand that going in. So just do the homework in, in the beginning and you'll be fine. Uh, the other thing is to understand that every modular factory out there doesn't build the same way. So you, again, as part of the homework, you've got to find out what they're comfortable in as far as the type of building, the number of stories, or the size of the project. Some factories are more suited to build large projects. Some are better suited to build smaller ones. Uh, other factories specialize in medical facilities. Others would rather stay in the multifamily housing or student, or student housing. You have to understand what they can do and what their, their comfort uh, area is. Um, the other thing that you need to bring into the, is the fact that know what can be built once you decide on a factory what can actually be built in that factory don't have a factory try to do something they don't have a comfort level for and that's been a big fallback that we hear about pitfalls because somebody's asked somebody to do something that they've never done before so you either have to know that up front and the factory is going to be honest with you and then to say okay i have to bring in a specialized subcontractor or maybe it's a better scope of work to finish off in the field. Because all you're trying to do is get that finished project at the end. And the last thing is just a statement I want to make is that when people hear the word modular, they think it's going to come out of the factory 100% complete. That's never going to happen. And I'm sure the rest of the panel would agree to this. You have to know what's going to come out and what still has to be done in the field. And that's where your modular general contractor can help you with that scope of work. And I thank you very much and uh, turn it over to our next presenter, Stacy. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so my name is Stacy Scapano and a uh, quick intro and background on myself. Uh, I have the privilege of being chief technology officer at Skender. 
Uh, prior to that, I headed up innovation at Skanska across our four different uh, business divisions in the U.S. and the United States. And for that, about a 14, 15 year stint in various AEC technology firms, most notably as senior strategist for construction at Autodesk. Um, here at Skender, uh, by way of background for the organization, uh, what, I, what I like and what I hope to bring to this conversation this afternoon is I think we represent kind of your, your bread and butter meat and potatoes contractor across the United States. We're 64 year old regional contractor. Um, and I think about two, two, almost three years ago now, we had kind of a leadership offsite that basically was instigated or per, practically provoked in 2017 by the McKinsey reinventing construction uh, research paper that was published that almost anyone on this call is probably extremely familiar with. And it was, it was almost along the themes of hacking the productivity challenges in construction. We know the chart were flatline over a 40 year span versus manufacturing. And I, I, you know, for the purposes of trying to hammock around what is industrialized construction means, it's, it's, it's really a hard reflection of, well, if manufacturing has continued to advance its productivity rate, what has been the systemic challenges in construction? And I think what was most provocative to our leadership team is that article in 2017 just seemed way out of whack. There was a 51% productivity upside gain to embracing different concepts around industrialized construction. They, they, they broke it down in seven levers. You can Google it, read it. Um, and we looked at, as a leadership team, what were strategies that we could mobilize like I said, as a regional contractor, you know, a successful one, but, you know, with modest means of, uh, you know, a low single digit uh, profit margin industry that construction represents. And we started turning to two strategies that I think uh, really kind of now classify our modular business moving forward. The first one, obviously, as you see in the picture, is beginning to mobilize some investments around setting up an advanced manufacturing uh, facility inside the city of Chicago. And I put that asterisk there because that'll point to a lot of other themes uh, later in the conversation. And the second, as, as Chuck said, there's, you know, as, as you start thinking about the systems, you start zooming out, you start thinking about the traditional interactions of design, engineering, and construction. We realize that, you know, as Chuck said, getting that developer commitment early, a lot of the work that was happening in offsite industrialized construction modular back in 2017, 2018, 2019, when these decisions were being made, it was more of a value engineering exercise. Projects were designed the conventional way, developers were looking at feasibility studies and then turning to a builder to see what alternative approaches were. And the challenge with that, I think as Chuck was alluding to, is that you know, so many decisions and constraints get locked in with not having that early engagement. And so that's why we mobilized the second strategy of also incorporating and building up an architectural practice to complement a design for manufacturing discipline to feed this factory. And I think this is what begins to tell you about our journey. I think that's going to be really interesting with the panel as we open up the conversations is that's exactly what it is. And you hear it with Chuck. We learn every day. Uh, we are reinventing business models. We are reinventing pro uh, project delivery models. Um, you know, we are designing and pointing towards means and methods, which is a huge risk slap in traditional delivery models. And you know, you, those lessons learned, you embody them, and they turn into those efficiency gains that you begin to see that McKinsey was articulating in those 51% productivity upside. I mean, so now looking back on this where we're at in the journey. We ribbon cut that factory. Um, we opened the doors in May of last year with our mayor's eighth day in office, lots of support with the city. We could talk about what that means for your, um, your AHJs. A, a lot of support, a lot of uh, solid market response, you know, potentially even why, you know, I, I, our team has presence like even on this call. And what that basically means is where we're at in the journey in hindsight, 18 months, after opening up the factory floor, uh, having a global pandemic, I, I'm, I'm really excited to say that instead of the low profit margin drivers, instead of just trying to hack the productivity conversation, our, our team's perspectives have dramatically shift. Our, our motivations are a little bit different now. We have, um, as the previous slide showed, we have this 
amazing workforce development opportunity ahead of us afforded by industrialized construction practices. And if you do a quick pulse check, there's the, in some states, the average uh, tradesperson in our industry, our median age is 45 years old. And, and we're going to have an even exacerbated a, a retention and attraction issue moving forward in the coming decade. We've got just, you know, systemic issues around sustainability when lots of people are very familiar with 40% of the world's energy statistics here in the United States. The DOE will state that is all around heating, cooling, and lighting up people inside buildings. And then half of the world's solid waste is basically contributed from our industry. So from the sustainability hat, we've got a lot of challenges that we're looking at this approach, the productization from projects. Um, and then finally, most importantly, the affordability. Um, you know, 30% of people on this call are from New York City. If you look at what the, um, the notion of affordability would mean in terms of housing and why it's crescendo to a crisis level peak, San Francisco, New York City, you need to be 200% average income for you to offset your traditional construction costs in your markets that say your housing is affordable. Here in Chicago, it's 140%. My old hometown in Atlanta is 120%. What this means is a marginalized middle while we're trying to subsidize housing for low income and you know, market rate is market rate. There's an enormous challenge for you know, a huge swath of our population. And what's really exciting if you stitch all this together in our collective journey is as you look at you know, the uh, offsite construction being a great incubator for innovation for process, a great space for workforce development, great space for mobilizing the emerging technologies that are coming online, even more so the, the innovations around these business models that hack away at some of these more noble causes outside of, you know, the dysfunctions in our industry are really exciting and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, this conversation with, uh, with my colleagues here. Great. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Paul Doherty. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the Digit Group. Uh, I'm a licensed architect, not a software architect, a real one. I can still get sued. Um, and uh, yeah, it's good to see a lot of uh, uh, familiar names and faces out there. So, uh, hello. But for most of you that do know me, uh, you know that we have a, uh, a pretty interesting company in that we have different focuses uh, based upon a holding company that is a real estate development company. Uh, we thrive on innovation, which means that uh, I usually get lots of bruises that I wake up in the morning. I don't know how I got them. Uh, but, you know, our focus always has been, uh, since the beginning of my career, has been on technology disruption. Uh, I was part of the founding team that developed Revit, uh, Buzzsaw, and in the facility management world, Tririga. You'd think I'd be pretty happy with that, but uh, no, I wanted to see the, the, the needle move. And what we did with the Digit Group was to pivot instead of uh, creating yet another technology to sell off and seeing if that needle would move, uh, we decided, well, we're gonna eat our own dog food. So just about 10 years ago, we, uh, uh, in China, uh, we decided to move into the world of urban development, uh, not just master planning and feasibility, but also literally putting shovels into the ground and let's see if we can really do this. What we quickly found, uh, especially in 2008, uh, and the result and effect of a global lack of workforce, as Stacy was uh, uh, alluding to there, uh, we were forced to get into uh, a process that would move us uh, away from uh, a labor intensive to uh, more of a data and knowledge intensive environment. Uh, what that means in labor terms uh, or layman's terms would be uh, we, we didn't have enough workers and we had projects that we had to deliver. So we're looking at everything. Uh, next slide, please. We're looking right now at everything that we do uh, into this idea of, 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 a, of a way of looking at <clears throat> our urban development. So it's never just one building, although those, each individual building is important, but it's that block, it's that neighborhood, it's that district, and then the urban fabric of the entire city. Um, we work in both uh, Greenfield and uh, we are just beginning to get into existing city, uh, which let me tell you something, is the biggest pain in the ass ever. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'd rather just start fresh with everything because at least, you know, you're making your own mistakes, but to inherit everything else is a big deal. So what we do is we, we tend to segment because of the labor shortage and the fact that we have to work in a world. And I thought that Chuck said it really, really well, 
you have to pick and choose where certain delivery models are, 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 are good or not. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, in the early part of my career, I was a big champion of design builds as a delivery model, not the only delivery model, but a part of delivery model. We're treating uh, this idea of the industrialization processes, be it modular, be it panelization, be it prefabricated, all those words have different meanings to different people, but at the end of the day, it's a new delivery model. Right now, we're averaging approximately 20% of our buildings are manufactured. And that's a pretty high number. And one of the reasons why is because most of our projects are greenfield. So we get to get into this conversation of product versus project. And I think that's something that as the panels talked before this particular event, um, <clears throat> we're all sort of going through that process right now that the AEC world has been brought up and we have our methodologies, we have our workflows, we have systems approaches for projects, including how we make money. We're now in a world of saying, we've got to now start to reimagine what this means of turning things into products. And I first was brought into this world and the nomenclature of manufacturing through K. Havdani and Homes. <clears throat> I was a corporate officer there for uh, approximately four years. I was in charge of all uh, land development and, and home production. When you hear the word production, that's product, which means I had to work, learn this world of cycle time which was, you know, was so bizarre to me because I came from the traditional world of stick built construction. But when you start to understand that cycle times are really where, where manufacturing processes and products make their money, that you can't have idle time. So we then started to rethink and reimagine by benchmarking ourselves, not against other AEC firms or not, not against other large scale production home builders, groups like KB Homes and DR Horton and, and Toll Brothers and all these other large uh, you know, uh, peers of ours. We start to take a look at things like, well, the scheduling. And <clears throat> by manipulating scheduling into benchmarking the way that scheduling is done at Boeing, at General Motors, at GE, we started to un understand that there's this idea of even flow production. And when you have even flow production, we're never talking about a project, which is why organizations uh, you know, like our friends over at Katerra are having a big problem. Last night, letting go all of those people. Um, there's some serious stuff going on out there, right? And what, what seem to be really good business ideas, when you take a look under the hood, they're still trying to make, I'm not saying Katerra does, but many people in, that get involved with this idea of, of modular and the industrialization of our, of our industry, they're still thinking project. This is our project and we're gonna make sure that we deliver it this way. When your production line, when you have a downtime because your, pro your next project has a lead time of like another 10 days, that's 10 days of loss that you're losing money. So we have to rethink about what are we manufacturing? And I really think one of the smart things that I see many manufacturers doing, uh, including Katera, is taking a look at, at components. Next slide, please. And in those components, we have this world of being able to take you know, a window, uh, an eight by 10 bathroom, a kitchen, and start to modularize those. The way that we do it, uh, and the way that we have done it in our Chinese factory, was to test this theory out. What, what can we manufacture for our own projects, but then geographically have available in inventory these, the, these components so that we can sell them to the local general contractors, which saves them time and money. So, wow, what a business model that is. Where the hell is that, you know, where the AIA, you know, documents come into that, they don't. This is why this reimagining time, this, this time of COVID, this time that, that we're all in a Zoom meeting instead of meeting face to face, this is our time to be in the COVID gymnasium. This is the COVID gym that we're no longer just talking about, you know, really cool things like the way that we manufacture is in flat pack. Why? Because modular volumetric does not work in China. Why? Because their roads suck. I mean, there's no way of, you know, of pulling that thing down the road. Now they try it, but, you know, they their transportation systems just aren't mature. So we went to flat pack, which then, of course, you know, they fit nicely into 40 foot containers. But with the COVID gym, what we're doing is taking that approach of understanding flat pack and saying that's a tactical approach to many things. And because it was so busy before this whole global lockdown, everyone was thinking tactical, but this is our time to think strategic. So what we've done now is actually repositioned our thoughts to say, why are we just dealing with MEP with our SIPs? Why aren't we also thinking about IT and integrating that into our deliverables? And what's, what's, what's emerged out of that is that one of the ways that we're starting to so listen to the market is through voice enabled environments where you don't need a smart speaker. We have a smart home. 
so that the IT is built into every one of our, 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 our buildings, like a, like a building's a computer. In other words, we're creating live on, uh, echo dots that you live inside, for lack of a better word. And it's fascinating because then every one of your units, especially when you're doing a development, like a block, a neighborhood, a district, you can connect things together. We're, we're literally creating the internet of buildings. That's very, very exciting. Next slide, please. I'm gonna wrap up with, uh, you know, with these thoughts. We've started in residential and we're good with the single family homes. Uh, you know, uh, for those of you that have been following with social media, uh, yes, we do great designs because we are a design led, design driven through science and data, moving through technologies that you normally don't use in our world, such as we use SolidWorks. Why? Because BIM does not work yet. It's not mature enough to drive CNC machines. Right? So we saw it works from an industrial productization way of driving our machines. And we were able to create, we were able to create 2,500 square foot homes uh, in under seven minutes with zero defects and zero waste. It took a long time for us to get there. Boy, we make a ton of mistakes and spent a lot of money on that. We then moved into commercial and started to look at this 20% deliverable model. Uh, and what we found was that because we owned these, these, these computers, these echo dots, and when we connect them together, we could provide aftermarket services. So much so that right now on the back of the napkin, as we're implementing this, we're seeing that the aftermarket services are making more money than the actual design and construction and delivery services. Wow, now all of a sudden we have to, again, reimagine during the COVID gym times of, well, let's test the idea. Uh, last slide, please. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, we do not do any outside sales. So I'm not here to sell any of you. Uh, don't send me email. No, I'm not going to sell to you. That's not what we do. Uh, you know, buy, buy more Revit makes me more money. Uh, so we're focused in first on Asia. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, we are, uh, uh, we were a Chinese factory. Uh, we are now no longer part of that operation. Uh, if you've heard of this thing called the trade wars, uh, yeah, we're a victim of it. Uh, it has been taken over by state owned enterprise. Uh, they took our IP, our equipment, but gave us a nice fat check. So Asia is still on the mark. Uh, we are now looking at opening up our next factory in the Middle East uh, that will service both Africa. And we are exploring uh, work here in the US, all for our own projects. So we have a lot more flexibility about going direct to customers rather than selling to a third party like a developer. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, I am also looking forward to these, uh, you know, the genius level folks that are on this panel. I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul. It's funny. It seems like every time I'm on a call with you, I pick up something uh, fun. So COVID Jim's going to enter my vocabulary here soon. Um, but hey, I want to thank the SES for having me on this panel. There's a lot of esteemed folks here, and uh, I'm privileged to be a part of it. <clears throat> so my name is Ray Boff. I'm uh, DPR's DPR Construction's uh, national prefab leader. My background's in, in construction management, modular manufacturing, uh, supply chain logistics, um, production operations, and production engineering. I've always been uh, in emerging construction technologies. Early in my career, I worked with a with a structural steel company, transforming conventional methodologies into like a automated manufacturing uh, kit parts approach. Uh, just recently, I was with a modular real estate developer in the San Francisco Bay Area, <clears throat> focusing on, on high density residential markets where I ran manufacturing operations. Um, we went through a lot of, of new product introductions over a, a very compressed time frame and, and really created truly amazing products uh, with a just in time delivery model. And so now I'm with DPR providing a prefab strategic direction offsite manufacturing guidance. Um, I guess for those of you who don't know DPR is we have over 30 offices across the US. We do about six and a half billion um, in revenue annually and, and we're uh, spread across healthcare, advanced tech, higher ed, um, uh, life science and, and commercial core markets. And we're really focusing on this whole prefab ecosystem. So not, not just solely focusing on, on the modular element of it, but, um, but, but I'll explain some of that later, actually, at the end of the, the presentation. What really motivates me is watching how poorly construction industry as a whole is making gains in productivity efficiencies. I mean, this is what Stacy mentioned. We've, we've all seen this McKinsey graph here. You know, it clearly shows we're having a fun time paralleling the x-axis there. 
In fact, we're probably crossing it in the wrong direction. Um, and so, you know, we're, the construction industry though is, is really great at creating new technologies, um, you know, means and methods, but, but are we really pushing it the right direction? And so, um, next slide, please. Uh, industrialized methods of construction, and what it means to me, it's, it's really listening to what manufacturers can do. And because they've been through the design for manufacturing and assembly activities uh, to, to, like, to really produce their products that best fit their business model. And Chuck spoke of this earlier, uh, don't ask manufacturers to provide something different, ask them what's different than what they last provided and how their products have improved. Um, more uh, the most sophisticated manufacturers are using um, you know, very granular levels of, of detail uh, in BIM and VDC efforts and automation directly from their models to their factory floors and their equipment, uh, as well as the uh, really innovative supply chain um, strategy. And this is what, um, what oh, and also a, a really advanced production system. So uh, Paul mentioned this earlier, you know, focusing on, on throughput and, and, and constraint mitigation is, is heavily um, uh, directly related to the success of, of, of massive uh, economy of scale and economy of scope of, of products. Uh, and so if you haven't read uh, The Goal by Eli Goldrack, I, I suggest you pick up that book. It's a simple read, but it's really great about talking about uh, interdependent activities and statistical fluctuations. So um, good book. So industrialized methods of construction um, requires that we follow steps in, in that product life cycle and, and then have that concurrent engineering uh, kind of activities alongside it. Because that will, that will improve the products that have a higher quality, have a faster delivery, and then and become more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and I think that's what industrialized methods of construction is. And so if we don't stop recreating stuff on project after project, we can't focus on those continuous improvement opportunities. Uh, other industries are doing this really well. Agriculture, maritime, aerospace, they, they all have kind of picked up on that concurrent engineering model and, and look at root cause analysis. And I think RCA is really important. Uh, you may have heard of Ishikawa diagramming, it's the fishbone diagram, but that's a good way to isolate, you know, what the problems in the system are and, and how to improve on it. Um, and so, let's see. Lastly, um, you know, the use of digital components is really where I think we're going. So the digital components, parametric design, and then and, and generative design elements are, are great because it best informs, you know, the, the selection and then the use of those components to meet building program needs. Um, let's see here. So from, from our angle, this is a great slide. So this shows some of our workflow. And, um, so DPR is really making a massive effort to, to shift that stick built kind of uh, environment into a more product based assembly method because every building has systems. They have structural systems, facade systems, bathrooms, stairs, elevators. So why not break down the systems into products and then populate those products across uh, core markets. Um, by doing this, we can, we can, we, we DPR are building our own components. Um, with entities such as, as SurePods, which is one of the bathroom pod pictures you saw earlier, uh, and then digital building, uh, which is a light gauge load bearing system, uh, exterior panel system, and interior rough and wall system. Uh, and then, you know, we're advancing our supply chain networks as well, creating great agreements, uh, and great relationships with, with the whole prefab ecosystem. And then I think what's extremely important is that we're, we're developing product data management systems. And what that does is it let, allows us to become very organized and, and deploy various elements of the prefab ecosystem on our projects uh, and then improve those components in a, in a PLM, a product lifecycle management type of environment. Um, and so then we follow this virtual mock-up, uh, virtual uh, mock-up workflow. This, this graphic's outdated, so you know, I can't give up all of our special sauce, but, but we start with the large constraints. Um, we were, or Paul was talking about that earlier, you know, the constraints such as, you know, the, the logistics to the site, the geometric masses of what can be shipped, uh, what the AHJs have to say, what, what the uh, inspection requirements are, and those parameters are what, what kind of constrain us to the selections that we can make. Um, and so now we're focusing on advancements in, in the generative design process, so that'll help us pr 
get better information back into those components so that we can con con continuously improve. Uh, last, last slide here. Um, okay, so this is the how we categorize prefab. You know, we really need to improve the way we communicate about offsite manufactured products. And so this is an example of our prefab pyramid. I'm not gonna take full credit of it because I think we've seen, you know, varieties of this in, in various textbooks, but we established a way to communicate better. Um, earlier in, in, in getting together with this panel, there was a conversation about the creator of the products uh, we use is so far from the designers designing the spaces so we need to bridge that gap. I can see Paul nodding his head because I think he and I probably geeked out about that for about 10 minutes too long. But you know, what has to happen is we have to educate our designers on, on how machines work, how the digital transformation of a model to the manufacturing, manufacturing floor works. Um, you know, create awareness about the, the increased levels of the pyramid. So as you go up in these engineered order systems, you have multi-system components, and you have uh, multiple system, multi-system components. You start to get to the third tier where you have some volumetric influence. And then on the top is, is the whole volumetric modular uh, solution that incorporates all systems in, in as much offsite manufacturing um, as possible. So um, you know, we're already seeing schedule improvements by, by folding our schedules. We have our on-site and off-site parallel paths, which we've seen cut down uh, our project schedules by you know, up to 50% by using various components on this prefab pyramid. Uh, but you know, once we start getting that more redundancy in that economy of scale and economy of scope, that, that's when we'll really start to see some of the, the cost uh, uh, driven um, you know, differentials there and, and the reductions across multi-platforms and, and core markets. So uh, that's what I have to say and uh, look forward to opening up to the Q&A session. Thank you, guys. That was absolutely fantastic. So we've got some great questions from the audience. I wanted to start with one that ties back kind of to the mission of SCS, and that was from Brian Sayre. You know, underlying a lot of what you do is software. So Brian had a great question, which was, what solutions are manufacturers missing? What are gaps in, in solutions, software solutions specifically that you're seeing? Uh, I'll take a swing at this. Uh, I think Paul and Ray kind of gave their perspective about how the manufacturing industry and the tools that kind of emerged from their process innovation was product centric and a product lifecycle management. They were able to sweat every detail and then begin to mobilize supply chains and productions based off of those models. Um, no offense to Paul's past life, we had a similar model with the rise of BIM in the late 90s and early 2000s. However, uh, our design processes, the design, the, the delivery models tend to still need to memorialize documentation as a handover deliverable. And that begins to fundamentally break all those efficiencies that manufacturing has seen. So the reason why I gave you that preamble is I, I, I'll try to be as useful as possible on a, a, a kind of a framework of view, not kind of logo brand the afternoon for software providers. But Stepping back as we've mobilized technology investments to complement this thing behind me, um, we look at foundationally what do we need to be massively productive. And, and what I was just talking about is how do we enhance the productivity of design engineering and detailing to drive production, that design for manufacturing. These guys are talking about a PLM approach. We mobilize you know, an architecture team they, of course, their, their kind of industry standard continues to gravitate towards Revit. So we continue to try to leverage that and work and partner with the technology providers to bridge Revit's gaps and from a PLM-like view, product lifecycle view, to begin framing up usable um, kit of parts and production libraries. So that's, that's an enormous opportunity. And, uh, you know, it, since we didn't pick a ground up manufacturing platform, but you know, began to complement the design tools that we had. That's gonna be a work in progress for some time. However, we're getting some good wins and doing that in a partner-like approach. If you then begin, to, and the same thing can be said for production too. There's a number of technologies out there that just are kind of our table stakes for processing now that you're self-performing you know, raw inputs into uh, a building components. If you go up another layer of kind of our roadmap pyramid, we then start looking at augmentation before automation. 
Um, and the reason is Ray talked about the goal, which I'll underscore that recommendation. Because what you understand before you get to the top pyramid where your mind wants to wander to robots, building buildings in a factory and throwing it on a truck, um, what you really want to do is, if, especially if you come from our world of a regional contractor, you have limited amounts to invest month on month, year on year, and you need to, you need to put your chips on a position wisely. It needs to create return really quickly where you can totally crater your entire business by swiping your credit card at Best Buy. Um, so those foundational, what, what manufacturers would call manufacturing execution systems to where you can literally step by step by step give a utility to the production team down on the floor of walking the staff through what is needed, the, the right information, right time. There are now tools like Manufacton. I will I'll name drop those guys <laughs> specifically for uh, a prefab and industrialized construction because they're walking us and allowing that workforce development um, and workforce augmentation to help help out. In return, we can time step how the teams day by day, product by product, project by project are doing the production system and it gives us the data that we need to run our constraints analysis on our process so that we can place our chip on the squeakiest wheel in the system. And that will change. Every time you solve a problem, it's like squeezing a water balloon, something's gonna squish out somewhere else. And that's kind of the theme. I, you know, I take the, read the goal, that's, that's what you would take away. Is that you're constantly looking, if you're diligent about tracking production, you'll constantly learn where can you, A, redesign the inefficiency out of the design process or the production process? And then and only then will I come out of the back of the bus for our team and go, hey, I think we've got a software or automation technology opportunity here to resolve that squeaky wheel. So it's more of a framework. Uh, I think uh, the, the big takeaways for us kind of on you know, 18 to 24 months into our journey that low level productivity opportunity is gonna lie on how you get to those kit of parts and how you mobilize that manufacturing execution system so that you have eyes on and informing those bigger ticket decisions for technology moving forward. Yeah, so Stacy, one of the big issues that, that, that we had was, and, and, and I think you're defining it is, what, what I'm looking for doesn't exist right now. And that's so frustrating. Right, because really what we're looking for is something that is in the PLM world, framework wise, that connects into a supply chain that we all speak the same language. Guess what? It doesn't exist. You know, I mean, holy cow. Being able to talk through to, uh, you know, anyone in a CSI 16 division building product manufacturing world and throughput that into a PLM type of world so that we're then taking care of our customers based upon it being a product that can be, you know, aspirationally, we'd love to have service contracts knowing that this particular, uh, uh, you know, system or component uh, has a life cycle to it. We know that we can get out ahead of it, that there's going to be a repair, there's going to be preventive maintenance, all these types of things. That, that's the holy grail. Guess what? None of it exists. Just getting ourselves to make sure that Oh, and, and, and then the greatest thing is, you know, like, here I am, yeah, 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 like I was on the Revit team and blah, 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 yeah. Let's try and use it. Holy moly, what a freaking crap shoot that was. This <laughs> does not work in the manufacturing process yet, yet, right? I mean, there's lots of promises out there, especially, you know, like with all the research and development money that, that, that Autodesk is using to improve Revit, not, right? So, so we had to look for something out there and SolidWorks seemed to be at least a step in the right direction, but holy cow, that's, that's like another train wreck because it brings with all of these things that, 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 that you're highlighting. We're, we're literally trying to define what that pathway is within a framework. And then it is just like, we're throwing something in there, see if it works. Nope, that doesn't work. I mean, we are really in a pioneering area right now because if it were, put in place, we'd have a lot more competition out there right now. I have to plus one you there, Paul. I think that there are a lot of <clears throat> great solutions out there, um, but it's really the vertical integration of how you get from concept to, to turnover and even facility maintenance uh, feedback too. So there, there may be a lot of various softwares out there that can help us do what we need to do, but they don't all work together. So <clears throat> what I look at 
what I try to focus energy on is when someone says they created a you know API or some sort of a plugin for interoperability of data between systems. And so that's where that's where we kind of try to that is the bottleneck. That is the Herbie, if you've read the goal. You know, that's to me in the, the digital process that where we need to focus and improve. Um, but I've worked with SolidWorks, worked with Revit, worked with Tecla, uh, MWF, you know, all of those are great in their ways. They just need some, um, you know, help getting from one system to another and not compromising data. Well, see, now this is where the opportunity is for people that actually understand the process, just like in, in the traditional world, right? We have a bunch of people in the software companies that may or may not have experience of swing and hammer. How many of the Teclas and the SolidWorks and everything else have been in behind CNC machines actually seeing how the damn thing works, right? So, you know, there's almost like this opportunity, again, in the COVID era of really taking an approach of, of thinking through, are, do we have processes and workflows that, hell man, automating stuff right now, especially with writing code, you may have people inside of your own damn firms that can do better than some of the outside software manufacturers for actually just, you know, writing this stuff. I mean, I'm watching these kids on Python. I'm going, damn, where have I been all these years? You know? <laughs> yeah. And that brings up a good point, Paul. I mean, it's a lot of us uh, generationally are looking at kind of the tools that we saw that were bright, shiny objects that were coming online as we were going through, say, the middle years of our career. And there's just a new breed of capa capabilities and technological acumen that could be digested. It was one of the things I had meant to say earlier. One of the opportunities that industrializing construction gives you is this controlled environment. The 101 conversation around industrial construction is, you know, weather risk and safety risk. You know, you're removing that. Yeah, check, check, check. That's, uh, I can get that in a 10-minute read. What's also interesting, like the people controlling the environment for the technology allows you to explore and, and kind of meet where some of the emerging technologies are. For instance, automation, for instance, laser projection, for instance, the challenges with AR, with sunlight coming through your glasses on a construction site. Not an issue, not an issue, not an issue here. We can also control and condition the environment to meet some of these emerging technology spaces where they're at to find earlier adoption along the factory floor. And I think that's kind of cool. And uh, not to mention, I can, I can start to calculate, like I said, um, under the banner of the goal suggestion, how it's resolving different constraints in the process. And that makes it, that shifts it from cool to more than useful. I mean, it, it definitely directly impacts our bottom line. Sounds like we need to start a book club. <laughs> Good place to start. So uh, we're going to hang on. on <laughs> we're we're going to hang on for another half an hour. Um, I wanted to ask another question that, that you guys have hinted at, and, it, and it's the, kind of the degree and approach to a vertical integration, because it's sort of implied in what you're saying. But how do you how do you think of that, and and the limits, and and just sort of your your overall approach? Could you reframe that question? Yeah. yeah, vertical integration. How, how are you thinking about uh, vertical, in, vertical integration? Is it, is, is it, I mean, it's inherent in what, what we're talking about, but where do, you, where do you start to set limits and where do you see it start to run out of gas? Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, so uh, sorry, Paul. Um, so I'll, I'll even try to throw a softball to Chuck because he's the token developer on the, um, on the call. We talked about this in, in some of the introductions. For, for us, what we see, and I think even Ray brought it up, there are just so many constraints. It, as soon as you even pick property and land bank as a developer, you've already started a process of mobilizing constraints on a design team that mobilizes constraints on the engineering detail and in production process. And so for us, I think the biggest value proposition that we've seen are kind of twofold on vertical integration. We've talked a lot about moving from projects to products by having a full-fledged design team. That means that we can kind of take a step back, thinking about how we're building out libraries and kit parts for each project, but really even formalizing what a product-based approach could be as a solution for, you know, certain lots in certain urban environments for housing solution, certain repeatable structures that you see every day when you drive down an exit ramp and you may want to pull off and grab a coffee or uh, a crappy meal or a crappy night's sleep. There are certain products that those are already begotten, let alone the embedded standardization in the building codes that we all see. And those will actually point you into common spaces. 
So there's lots of ways that you can do that. And then vertical, vertical integration allows us to be constantly toggling from a project-based view, which we're all familiar with, to taking that step back view of the library of components that we can build with and how do we express them in potentially a product. Um, the other, on the other end of the factor, and this is why I was trying to throw a softball over to Chuck, is the conversations that we can have with our development customers are more partner-like. We're providing advisory to how do you bank land, to mm -hmm. how you do these early feasibility studies, and that you're growing. You're no longer bidding work. If I go all the way to the other end of the bookshelf, you're not bidding work anymore. You're a trusted partner. You're helping rationalize. It's not a sales pitch at this point. You're really jointly working together to take that systems approach that Chuck talked about and optimize the goals of the developer that fine tune what you have built out in that kind of standardization process. And I think that's really key. And that's how you begin leveraging the economies of scale that Ray introduced earlier. Yeah, to add to that, you know, working from either myself as a developer or for when we work for clients is that you have to have that educational process where you want to become a partner with that developer, understand their goals, what they're looking for. Uh, it even comes down for us is which architect that we recommend for a particular project, because not all architects, you know, have the knowledge base, whether it's the type of building again, or they really understand modular construction. Uh, then once we know we have the, that team, now when we start talking about the products, a window, door, exterior cladding, bringing in the subcontractors who supply that material, let's talk with them. Can they do what we're looking for? Don't ask them to do it after the fact. Can they actually do it? Um, unlike uh, what Stacy was talking about where he's vertically integrated with his own design team, we, we do it, but we're doing it with outside sources, the architects, the suppliers, but we bring them all into the same room and actually start working with them. There have been many times that we, we just say, this product's just not going to work, or it's not going to work in the manufacturing environment, but we could utilize it as part of the site scope. That's what we try to do to bring it all together. Um, I will say something, though, too, is with regards to, it's something I brought up in my initial uh, introduction, is that a lot of times I run into clients whose architects are not truly open-minded to the system, that we're building a product in a factory, and how do you maximize that efficiency? You maximize that efficiency by everyone, especially the architectural side, understanding what does it take to take a six-sided biometric box and bring it down a production line. Once they start understanding that, then they can see how they can start working with efficiencies, which is very important. I, I just use as example, I have a project right now that we're working on where it's the architect really spent in a tremendous amount of time understanding what it is to build in a factory. To the point that, and I'm sure Stacy will appreciate this, he has four buildings, they contain either studios, one, twos, or threes, but the entire project is built around one modular size. That's as efficient as I have seen in a long time. Now he started from scratch and he's doing something, but he's, then he took it the next step. Okay, because he's building a, we're building a building that is passive house construction plus net zero. We started bringing in every specialist, whether it be the window manufacturer, the exterior cladding manufacturer, all into the room. This is what we want to do. Can you do this? No, you can't. Well, I'm sorry. This is not the project for you. And we did it that way to the, become a very, very efficient process. But in all my years, I, this is the first time I actually saw someone take it to the extent of having multiple uh, size living units, but all based around one size modular. That just becomes so efficient in a manufacturing process. Yeah. Oh, and, and Sorry, Hugh, uh, just to kind of underscore some of what, uh, especially around vertically integration, what does that, what I've been amazed in our journey is just some of the accidental short-sightedness we've had that we've always done things with. And you, you actually see it, it it's, it's loud and clear when you're operating vertically integrated because your trade-off analyses, your trade-off decisions have a totally different envelope. You, we can 
make decisions on more expensive products, for instance, those windows, because we're going to save it in the cooling systems, because we're thinking about it more holistically. And this is, I, I don't mean this any, by any means by a kumbaya. We just see it every day. We're giving higher quality bathroom experiences with wall mounted toilets because that price premium buying that elegant toilet seat is actually offset by just a four minute install on workstation four because we've done the labor analysis that does more than offset the cost of a premium upgrade. And you actually end up doing more with less if you start taking a step back and instead of optimizing for your role in the long list of stakeholders from developer to user, and, and the more that you're vertically integrated and or collaborative, you begin to say, hey, I'll take this one because I can see the three other benefits downstream that provide a net benefit to the system. And then from that to the product, from that, more than one just project. And that's what I think is really interesting. All of these themes, to me, there's this other takeaway of these trade-off analyses when we're optimizing for my role on a project versus the trade-off decision for products can, that can be expressed across multiple projects. That's where affordability starts coming in from, from the market side. That's where I think a lot of the opportunity over the next five to 10 years as we mobilize and begin to either internally internalize these benefits or pass those benefits on to our customers, you begin to see momentum behind what we're talking about today. Which is why one of our big issues, Stacey, just to hop on that, is that in order to perform that type of analysis from product line to product line, uh, we have to start looking both vertically and horizontally through that data. Now, here's the problem. Are you using IFC, EIEIO, Kobe this? Uh, Jesus, come on, man. We, we, we already had a taxonomy and a classification system during stick construction. I don't know what the hell happened over the past 20 years, but people forgot about your know, master format. That's a pretty, you know, all the well, they tried to confuse it by making 4,000 different, you know, divisions. But let's just get back to the old school of 16 divisions. Being able to say that doors and windows, division eight, you know, uh, finishes division nine, concrete division three. What we're able to do is start to see where those component um, specific analysis so that we can generate a report to say we can improve this. And you're right. The, the offsets of those is where the magic happens. And the good firms are going to be the ones that understand that we need to shift this or we need to have this supplier. Uh, I, I mean, look, look what's happening right now with supply chains where, you know, there's certain materials that are really on a spot market. Uh, you know, you can't purchase something with a locked in price with a two week look ahead nowadays. Good luck with that. Right. But in the manufacturing business, we almost have to do that. When, you know, at K. Havnanian, we were good at doing what was called national contracts because we were doing 20,000 McMansions a year. Right. We, so we would go to, to uh, you know, we put out a bid and say, we want a national contract for 20,000 refrigerators. And we're, and we're expecting the price to be in this, you know, world. Not that we wanted to dictate what that was, but guess what? We could. Now, look at that when you have a supply chain of a modular factory. Now, all of a sudden, it's not about just one building type. McMansion's, you know, in the case of Kahov. But now we're, we're in the position of listening to the market. So I'm thinking we're getting down to data classification as a foundation piece to start your modular business has to be in place because from there, you can build not on a house of cards, but something that at least everyone can say, at least we're talking the same language so that when we get into the supply chain issues, when we start getting into looking at vertical and horizontal trends, we can as, as a business start to adapt and adopt them. So one of the things that's come up um, a couple of times is the process you've all gone through. Um, what's a good way for people to start? We've talked about the, the, the theory of constraints and, and the goal, but you know, Chuck, you talked about architects and someone really Drink spent heavily. a lot of time on it. <laughs> Drink heavily. That's how you start. <laughs> I was going to say uh, money and time. That's a good thing. But, uh, and patience. Don't launch your product until it's right, <clears throat> but don't wait too long to launch your product or else you're late. There's a very uh, kind of uh, fine time frame there. New product introduction is a difficult thing. It takes money and it takes a lot of, a lot of um, intellectual property and, and taxonomy and you know, organization. And, and, um, but at the same time, if you launch it too quickly, then, then you'll spend all your time trying to improve the product to the point where where um, you can't get the throughput that you need in order to make projects pencil. Um, 
And so, yeah, it just, uh, I think sitting on a design and improving it uh, with a digital twin uh, first is extremely valuable. And then having that supply chain in place uh, theoretically and then literally, uh, and then you can have the, the deliveries happen in a warehouse environment and stay organized there with the warehouse system and, and then start producing your product. But I can't remember who it was. I think it was maybe a Tim Cook that said, if you launch a product that's 100% ready, it's 100% late. But Hugh, yeah. to your original question, Hugh, is the fact that I can't stress enough for anybody who wants to look at a modular project to do their homework because too often, and I don't know how, why this is, they think that we can say, uh, somebody, somebody will come to us and say, all right, I wanna, I wanna put a uh, 50 unit department complex up in New York City. What's the price? I don't know. I, I don't have enough information. So you gotta do a lot of homework up front, and, but you gotta make the decision that you're going with Modular because it meets your criteria then you start with the other team members, as I said, the architect, the general contractor, and the right manufacturer. I mean, your team members should be able to guide the developer through that process, because I, I, I'll just tell you uh, one story. I, I, I know of a developer who spent three months talking to a company, will not name them, to find out after three months of all this work, the company didn't build the type of product that he needed for New York City. New York City requires all steel frame construction. This particular company only manufactured wood. So he's wasted three months. Now, was that the, the fault of the developer or the fault of the manufacturer for not being honest to tell them that's not what they do? Do the homework, go through the process, go through checking with regulatory agencies. Don't start designing something and then find out down the road, I can't get it to the job site or I can't lift it into place because you didn't do your preliminary studies. It's a lot of homework up front, but once you do it and you do it with your team, the project can be successful. It's like pre-task planning. You know, it's, yes. you have to go through every single one of the steps um, in each one of the, you know, the work cells, if those work cells are on the factory floor or if they're out on the job site or if they're going through the permitting and approval process, you know, those all have a, have a path, a critical path and those, each one of the, you have to understand what each one of those particular tasks are within those those milestones and and you have to work through it um and yeah exactly what chuck said it's uh do your homework uh run a mock-up if you have a digital twin environment where you can actually do that then then that's a great a great system to try it in right you just said something um, that I, I just gotta add this because ray just said something that's so important when he said mock-up I insist with the client that there should be an actual mock-up of part of the building. It's a modular. It's a working modular. It's probably going to be the last piece to be installed, but use that as your prototype to work out any bugs uh, that could possibly be there. Okay. That has nothing to do with modular, just to go through the aspects. I had a project one time where the uh, design team did everything they were supposed to do. They did their color boards. They submitted everything to the proper people, except for one person, the president of, the, of this one university. So we were trying to be nice for the president. We actually had the mock-up in the factory, uh, worked with the university's uh, uh, furniture supplier. So it was an actually a fitted out dorm room. The president walked in, looked at everything. He says, I don't like the color of the walls. I don't like the color of the floors. I don't like the light fixtures. And the lead architect is standing next to me. I'm saying, he's got his head down. Says, Don't worry, it's the mock-up. At least you can change it. Imagine we built the whole building this way. What? Long story short, make sure you get the buy-in of everybody too. Yeah, and, and I'll double down on that, Chuck. Um, I mean, Ray started the, 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 his response to the question of how you get started with time and money, um, getting everyone's buy-in with clients. And if, if, if I think about just taking an enormous step back from this topic and, you know, buying a really good mirror. Um, you know, your company, your organization has a certain capability that is in a certain sweet spot or lack of a sweet spot in a certain market. 
you know, there, there were some VCs that are chiming in on the chat here. You have to think like an investor. You have to have a strategic team or the buy-in of a strategic team to really roll up the sleeves and figure out what is the capital and what is the time horizons that we'll deploy and what are the success metrics, the gatekeeping and doubling down on these bets. Um, this is expensive. Uh, this is expensive every day. Uh, general, general contracting tends to be a rental-based business. We don't buy anything. We just pass through and manage those resources. Here, you actually pick and, and mobilize dollar, and that is really uncomfortable for someone that's grown up in construction, and, and, and they're thinking about how they get collect fees on general construction projects. Here, you've got to take a team uh, and, and, and think differently. Think about what product market fit you have, what your opportunity really sees that, and then that mirror comment was really specific. Um, Clayton Christensen passed away earlier this year before the pandemic, uh, wrote a, a timeless piece of the innovator's dilemma in the 90s. I constantly try to say it's invalid. I constantly am proved wrong. Do you have the culture? Do you have the team internally? Do you have those capabilities to formalize that? If not, you may have to think about a different band of lunatics to drive this in concert where you're not disrupting your apple cart. And you've got to figure out organizationally where you're at um, and especially what, where your leadership team is at and what, what opportunities they'll afford. You, you had asked, uh, you know, how, how do you even start if you're looking from the inside in? And, uh, uh, you know, in our perspective, we had a partner with someone that was already doing a form of this, uh, uh, and you know, and I know our friend David Pei over in, uh, uh, he was an Australian that was in China. And his company, uh, before he moved to China, was actually doing uh, housing uh, modules for, uh, for Reno Tinto, the, the mining company out in the bush of Australia. And he knew that he could do something more. Uh, and so when he approached what, what we were thinking of, along with our idea of outside manufacturing, because that's what production home building does, that combination was really interesting. Um, and just to give you guys some real numbers out there, uh, because, well, <laughs> we don't own the factory anymore. Uh, it took us uh, about 24 months to really get it right, uh, meaning from the time that we purchased the uh, factory, stripped it down, put our lines in place, and then started modifications, right? Uh, that took approximately 12 million US dollars, which is extremely cheap. Just to let you guys know what the capital costs are with this. That's with Chinese labor, uh, you know, importing CNC machines from Europe uh, and, uh, and then modifying them. Uh, getting labor in place from the design aspect, internal design, Stacy, which, uh, you know, sounds like a great idea, but you and I should go drinking one night and really tell those stories. Uh, because you're right. You think you find the right type of designer and they could be great. But my goodness, until they really see how the machines work and understand both the constraints and the opportunities for what this can do, you know, how does a router really work on that structural insulated panel, you know, in our case? And, oh, you know, the, 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 anyway, time and patience, uh, you know, Ray, you know, you know, patience, I think, is probably the biggest piece of it, right? Because it's a capital cost, right, Stacey? And, and, and Chuck, you're right there, right? You know, it's like, you've got to put the time and the money into it. But, you know, we can't be experimenting. This can't be just like a, you know, like, like a sandbox forever. It's got to be a business. So, you know. Yeah. You know? Sorry, Paul. Uh, you, yeah. you just you, you said something that really is, is a bright red button for me to push, which is uh, I, I, at the very onset, I tried to describe this as a journey. If, if you go into this, quote unquote, investment or this, quote unquote, strategy thinking you're going to push this button and things are step changing in a different fashion, you're horribly wrong. Um, what I think about with our design team, you know, we've matched them together. There were process improvements, obviously, from day one, from project one. What I like the most about industrialized construction, you can stop the line once a week, and our designers will follow their designs onto the factory floor to get that knowledge, embed that back into the way they work. And those feedback loops, in industrialized construction are unparalleled in traditional delivery because they're lost in a different project partner. And that project partner, you, you blow that unit of measure project up, they're off on something else and you're, you're doing something very similar and you've lost that intrinsic knowledge. Um, and I, I love this from our factory teams, every work cell, the lead will stop once a week 
and they're looking at ergonomic design. You know, what are the, you know, the, the, these spaghetti diagrams that they're drawing, even how people are moving and how that's just broken. And is it just moving material differently? Is it putting a tool in a different place? Is it changing the entire picture? Those learnings are, I think, Ray, is what's going to bend our construction curve out from crashing below that X axis. And we just structurally can't do it if you're going from project to project in a traditional um, ad hoc team. And I think that's, that's super key. And that includes our designer. Great. So we got, we got one more question. Go ahead. Oh, so I want to just have one thing, though. Uh, you know, Stacy, awesome. Uh, gosh, you just brought me back to standing on a manufacturing floor looking that it's gone wrong and how do you fix it? You know, the Ishikawa diagramming, you know, that, that root cause analysis activity where you're looking at the six M's uh, and asking the five Y's is so valuable because it really does get down to, uh, to, to un uncovering what's the problem. And then that feedback loop is so valuable. And that's where I heavily promote product lifecycle management because you can make those improvements um, along the way. And, and then the next time that that product is installed, there is, you know, 10 modules down the line, um, it's right. Yeah, so, 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 so Paul, let me, sure. let me just try to get one more question. And sorry, we're, we're almost out. I wanted to get one more in because I think it ties up some of what you guys have said. Um, this comes from Alice, who's asking that companies like Capsule are producing kitchen modules treated as equipment that have a UL listing. So, are you guys seeing that so, sort of thing? So, so, and you, uh, we think alike. I, I actually saw that question and it ties into exactly what we were just talking about because we we're talking about internal processes. When you're starting off and trying to get things going, understand that you've got to put it somewhere physically on the planet Earth and there are limitations there. So the majority of time that we took for our first delivery, uh, uh, for our first deliverable, uh, was a project that we, uh, that we uh, were, were, were half developer on, meaning that we had partners. It was Russell Island, uh, Australia. You can check it out in Google. Uh, it was a project uh, for uh, with, with our development partner to put 4,000 single-family homes into close to Brisbane. Right now, first of all, they've never had a project like this this size, and we're dealing with the local building department that has inspectors and zoning and blah 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 blah. Our biggest issue, because we actually close up our walls and deliver it finished, right? And then of course. Like everyone knows, you got to modify because we have ways of connecting the walls through joinery. And of course, there's scratches and all sorts of things that happen, uh, you know, in, in, in the movement of those things. So there's always work in the field. But we've closed up. So what happens to the inspections for rough electrical, rough plumbing and stuff like that? We had to gain the trust of the local uh, inspectors first. And we had to come up with, with just innovation to make that happen. So we took a you know, took a, uh, an idea both from the automotive and the aerospace industry to say, what would happen if we taped everything? We would actually have cameras on with the unique IDs of the, the product itself finished all the way down to components that had all of those unique IDs in place so that the person could either watch it live being, being manufactured and said, yep, that meets all the criteria for my jurisdiction, or they can go back and, and look at it on a private YouTube channel. So there's going to be always these things about how to, again, how to continuously improve and how do we make sure that the products that, that we're delivering meet the, the localization issues, which are still the driver for the majority of uh, the world. Yeah, so I have three points on this really quickly. Uh, you can't get UL certified assemblies if you don't have a kit of parts. So it's a good reason to even just start this journey. Um, to the direct comment, Alex, a great point. When you look at the supply chain, you look at the innovation that's happening out there. It's why I, I, I shy away from phrases like optimize the supply chain to where we just genuinely partner with the supply chain. There are things that we don't even know about that are in the back lab that doesn't have a home in a traditional delivery model because they can't work their way into a spec book. But when we actually discuss the problems we have in production or in product design, you actually can see building product manufacturers that, that have emerged as strategic partners to ours that really intimately understand what we're trying to solve for, either out on site or in the production facility and create new products like what Alex is describing. If you turn the coin over, if you move now from project-based thinking to product-based thinking, how can I then work with your local building department to understand the permitting process. I'll give you some quick anecdotes. If you can log in to Chicago Building Department's website right now, 
the permitting process is averaging 72 days to get permit and plan review to, for approval. We can get that in less than 24 hours by submitting our pre-permitted designs that are product-based for the City of Chicago multifamily housing solutions. And that's because we did our work with the local AHJs. It was sweaty. There wasn't a project. We were talking about delivering a product that they can bless really quickly and bypass. So there are efficiencies in what Alice's intention of asking about for production that you can internalize. And then there are bigger ticket issues when you start thinking about the partnerships upstream and downstream from what you're doing. Fantastic. Listen, we're towards the end. I think we've got a minute for any last, any last uh, parting words. Okay. If not, I'm going to pass it over to Blake to close this out. Thank you all. This was fantastic. Guys, that was unbelievable. That totally blew my mind. So I was trying to take notes and control the presentation at one point and definitely could not keep up. Uh, a lot of people were asking, you know, in regards to that, will this recording be available? Yes, absolutely. It will be available via our website and we will post it via our LinkedIn as well. Um, to close things out, just two quick things. Number one, I'm going to have a quick exit survey um, that I will release right now for everyone to complete. And the second part is, I am going to leave this open. So if people want to continue the conversation, you know, as we did cut things short, please feel free. Um, as you guys are taking this survey, uh, just to note, our next event will be Thursday, September 17th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's a little bit later. We've got an interesting topic. We don't want to spill the beans yet and kill the momentum of this event. But if you could please feel free to um, take that exit survey. It does help us improve future events for everyone who's attending. And anyone that says poor, we know where you live. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Ireland, Norway. Yeah. We, had, we had some some fun folks. Well, tell you what, as a closeout, while we're sort of still hanging out, there were some good questions about circular economy and, and kind of the environmental side of this. We're not as regulated as some places, but what do you guys think? You know, from a marketing aspect, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just philosophically, I think it's sad that we have to market that we're being sustainable. What were we doing before? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, putting lead on a bunch of acronyms after your name and then associating that with your product. I guess you got to do it, you know, but it's, it's just a sad commentary that, that you have to lead with that, that we're talking about sustainability as a separate thing from good design. Um, but that's the state of the world. Uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, we do a lot of things with our mechanical systems and still tweaking. Uh, you know, we're using uh, options right now where we have uh, AV, so, sorry, UV and uh, ionization for the air intake uh, to make sure that your air is sterile. Why? Because everyone wants a safe home or a safe building now, right? Um, you know, the, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we're, we're constantly going out there and saying things, but are we going to lead with putting, you know, hey, you, we're going to put a solar panel on your roof? Come on, really? Uh, you know, that's so 2019. You know, we're into a different world now, uh, you know, that says that, that we, have, we have a responsibility as, as a product to not harm the sustainable economy, the sustainable, uh, uh, you know, world of, of waste, Right, because that's a huge deal inside of our industry. Stick construction, the waste, my God. You know, you, you always put a fudge factor of plus 10% with wood studs, right? Just because, you know, but with manufacturing, we, we, we don't have that. So one of the ways that we're trying to optimize, continue to optimize, Stacy, right? Because it's, it's a never ending thing of trying to understand when we're spraying our, our, our interior walls, right, with paint, uh, we now have a catch that then we can recycle all the drips. I mean, that's the type of thought process you have to think about. Why? Because it's not only the right thing to do, it's also economically really good. And if you can market it as sustainable, well then, you know, good on you. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a curmudgeon when it comes to that. We should be doing good design that's sustainable anyway. No. We're starting to see- I, 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 Oh, sorry, Rick. Yeah, I'm just gonna- plug um, um, some innovative structural solutions. Well, name any names, but, you know, we're starting to see a lot of uh, advancement in mass timber, which, you know, is a sustainable uh, sort of uh, cycle. So, 
you know, the only difficult point is that it takes a very long time to, to grow the, the materials. And then there's a lot of capital involved with, with having the facilities who can, who can produce it, but the technology is getting a lot better. The scrap or waste, waste uh, percentage is becoming much less and less. And um, yeah, I think that there's, there's some promising times there. Um, you know, uh, Paul, you were talking about waste factor and how manufacturing doesn't have that. You know, there, there still are uh, some certain percentage points that we can squeak out of what we're doing. And I think you made a great point about, about collecting the waste and then reusing it. It's kind of like what you know, the steel industry was doing for many, many years or what um, you know, plastics are doing as well and reforming and molding shapes that, that can re, be reused. Um, but it's the energy inputs that go into it that are what, what we need to focus on the most. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that we're starting to see a lot of innovative solutions moving away from traditional you know, concrete and steel and more into the wood right now. Yep. And, and really quickly, Hugh, I think it's really neat to look at the circular economy uh, there are a lot of micro level views on this, like recycling of materials that start hacking away at half of the world's solid waste that this industry generates, which is staggering. On the flip side, I was a, uh, you know, a hyper skeptic when we started this on the macro side, it's the building itself. But what's interesting is if industrialized construction is really bait and switch for rapid assembly of buildings by design, you've accidentally created an opportunity for rapid disassembly. So I think there's going to be a lot of merging and we can see this with some market demand and some client conversations that we're having on the adapt intentionalizing the adaptive reuse or intentionalizing actual disassembly for temporary housing conditions. And I think that's really fascinating. It's definitely by design, very early, whole life thinking. And that's, that's really wonderfully calibrated with a circular economy. So we've had a lot of questions about um, the, the labor shortage how have you guys seen these two related? Well, our, our, our resources are getting year after year, the average age of a skilled worker is a year and year older. So that's telling us that we don't have people entering into our skilled trades, but that, you know, <laughs> creates a whole bunch of opportunity for, for uh, work instructions and for on the job training and, and multiple skill sets on an assembly line. Um, I think that you can, if, if we do model our, our, our things properly, we can create those work instructions and, and give everybody a Lego set or a, you know, a, a IKEA kind of instruction manual to put things uh, together. And that's what's the beauty of, of that upfront design engineering stage is that you have to work through all of those little things. You have to look at the ergonomics of assembly so that you're not injuring your employees. You have to look at at, um, you know, the environment around you, is it hot, is it cold? Is it, it's, and, and so you know, there's a lot of those touch points that we kind of take for granted when we, when we talk about these things and, and maybe design things, but we don't really know how the end user is, is or the, how the uh, end assembler is assembling these things. Um, so I think it opens up for a gigantic labor pool that's, uh, that recently or previously hasn't been tapped. And also, Ray, I think that also brings up that some of the retraining that needs to happen also of how work gets done uh, needs to occur as well, which is why, you know, uh, you know, Hugh, you know that, you know, we've been all talking with the unions a lot, you know, those trade unions and about how they also understand that this is just yet another delivery system. It's not like, you know, all your jobs are going away, but it just means that your skill sets are, are going to be really, really, really important of how work gets done. In order to disrupt things, you have to understand how things are done first. That's number one. No, number two, um, a surprising thing happened in our factory that we learned that we, for uh, knocking out uh, 4,000 units, um, 2,500 square foot homes, uh, single family homes, uh, at any one time of our shifts, we only needed 12 people on the factory floor. So yes, there's an enormous need, but the scale is not going to be what, we, what you think. Like it's going to be, you know, 1200 people inside of a 500 meter, you know, factory. Uh, no, uh, you know, what we found was that the efficiencies that we saw, because we, we actually used efficiency and effectiveness along with productivity as our mission. Uh, and, and, and what we found was that, well, you know, including the tea lady, it was 12 people. Uh, now we're just one case, you know, and I'm sure with different typologies 
and different types of, of products, we'll probably need more or maybe even less. And we just don't know right now. But you know, if we're thinking that, you know, oh, you know, the, the, ma the manufacturing process is going to create even more jobs, I think they'll create jobs that are more that we don't understand the skill set yet because we're still going through uh, you know, the processes. Now, could we put a line in the sand and say, yeah, you know, this is fine. We want to just do this, you know, uh, you know, uh, the way we're doing it now and we're going to take a, you know, baby step approach, of course. And you have to do that because that's good business. But at, at the same time, we're still discovering what, what is the right amount of workers um, and are they more highly skilled? Or are we just talking about a retraining of already highly skilled workers? Uh, jury's out. One thing I can add to this part of the conversation is that our factory overseas, one of the things that we had to set up was an industrialized training center before we even got a approval to oh, build cool. the country. So the fact was, I won't go into the politics of where this is. I can always talk to you offline, but uh, they didn't have a training. People were coming out of high school uh, and they were basically going on unemployment. So the first thing they wanted to do was change and we have an industrialized training school, then they go right into the factory. Here in the United States, I think the factories have to start thinking about, can you pull anything from the Votech centers and bring those people into the factory? Because there's gonna be certain aspects of the, of the production that's never gonna change, running wire for electrical, setting a toilet fixture, things of that nature. But as Paul just said, there's other aspects of the production that has to be trained. And maybe the Votech centers don't even know that yet, whether it's being how to operate a CNC machine or whatever else of new machinery that's coming out to be utilized in the factory. And that's where the training is going to be. Because what we're saying is that if we don't change 20 years down the road, we're not going to find any labor out there. It's going to be very hard. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't want to overgeneralize labor. Uh, that and under the banner of understanding your constraints and really optimizing the solution, you, you have different levels of skill that's necessary. If you take a step back, the labor conversation is fantastic. When you begin to harmonize strategies and goals for your certain markets, we have a great relationship with our labor, our labor union here locally for development while we're recruiting. We've worked with the city and about 12 different nonprofits to raise point, to get creative, and Chuck's point, to get creative on sourcing that labor. I mean, we have haulers, laborers, and then skilled tradesmen on the floor. And we work with the unions to figure out what that means pre-development before they walk in on our site. Chuck, as you said, we created a deliberate training center on site, and then we certify them to work at the work cell. And then somebody in the chat talked about an apprenticeship model, which happens work cell by work cell. What I think is really encouraging, what this means is this factory is a jobs factory. Uh, we can take a, a varied spectrum of backgrounds, histories, demographics, man, woman, different age levels. The wear and tear here when Chicago experienced negative 40 degree temperatures last year, hard recruiting tool on a traditional construction site. Here we were overwhelmed. We had to shut for our first 30 hires we had to shut the recruitment down, the website down in less than three to four weeks because we were overwhelmed with applicants. So I, I don't want to minimize the, the, the labor shortage that we've had. You've got a different record level unemployment. We may see different dynamics in the next couple of years, but that age level is going to continue to persist. We'll get back to a near crisis level relatively soon, and you need to get creative about solving it. This is a perfect time for me to thank you all for your, your, your time. I don't want to take you any longer. It's already been an hour and 40 minutes. Awesome panel. Thank you all for your time. And uh, have a great evening. Thank you.